Hi, my name is Jack Hittery. It's a pleasure to be here to deliver this keynote today at this very, very important conference. Uh, today, I'll be addressing AI in the quantum age. Both quantum physics and AI are very powerful tools, but combined, they have the potential to solve problems that each alone may not be able to. And today, we're going to be exploring this interaction. How do we bring these two very, very powerful tools together to solve very significant problems in the world. And to do so, we're gonna explore the quantum landscape a bit and then understand how uh, there are different ways to combine these different techniques. Quantum technologies are not just about quantum computers. I know that quantum computers get all the headlines, but I encourage the audience to think about quantum sensing and quantum communications as well. We don't have a lot of time today to go into those areas, but in addition to quantum computing, these are very significant technologies. The first quantum revolution, of course, was the years 1900 to 1935. And this is when about 30 individuals developed quantum mechanics itself, which gave us a very new view on the world, a view that was not deterministic like the Newtonian world, but probabilistic in the quantum world. Uh, their students and the students of those students then created the second quantum revolution, an applied revolution, creating the transistor itself, without which we could not have this virtual conference today. The MRI machine, the laser, all created using quantum physics. And this now leads us to the third quantum revolution. The third quantum revolution started just in the last two, three years, giving us molecular simulation where we can simulate atomic and molecular interactions, uh, sensing, and security and comms. So we think about quantum computers, there's actually many ways to build quantum computers. I have a few of them on this slide. There's also additional ones such as neutral atom and others as well. And what's interesting about quantum computers is that people are not going to be purchasing quantum computers uh, for their businesses or their homes. They're gonna use them on the cloud. And one key takeaway please today is please don't buy a quantum computer. Instead, you have many, many cloud choices to get them on the cloud. And that's actually gonna be a great advantage of, of the quantum era in that we do not have to go through the many cycles that we did in the classical world of 30 years of people buying computers on premises, going through uh, those cycles, replacement cycles, usually seven to 10 years at a time. Instead, every time you go on one of these clouds, you're getting the latest quantum computer that they can offer, uh, accessing those qubits, running your programs, we call quantum circuits, on those computers and getting the output immediately from them. So this is a very accelerated pace of development because quantum computers are cloud native. They're born on the cloud. So what exactly is inside a quantum computer? Well, we have our qubits, our quantum bits, and we all know about bits. We can represent a zero or one value in a bit, but in a quantum bit, in a qubit, we can go beyond that. Uh, here, we can represent not just zero, one, as you see here, so zero up, one down, but also these linear combinations of the computational basis state. So if we have two vectors, zero and one, we can have a linear combination of them by putting coefficients, we call them amplitudes in quantum, but coefficients in front of each of those uh, computational basis vectors and making a third vector or a superposition vector. Again, from a mathematical point of view, it's just a linear combination. So nothing magical about superpositions, just a linear combination. But this Bloch sphere that we use, named after Felix Bloch from Stanford, uh, is how we represent the state of a qubit, because now we can represent uh, the state of the qubit terminating on any point in the sphere. And of course, there's an infinite points on the surface of a sphere. And so we have an infinite palette to draw from in terms of the value of this particular qubit. And if we look here in this representation of the block sphere, we can see that we can represent zero, again, by that vector going up, one by the vector going down. We can have a 50-50 linear combination here by apply, applying a gate or an operator called the Hadamard operator. And we can even also do rotations to get something like a 75-25 uh, split so that when we do hundreds and hundreds of measurements on this particular qubit, in fact, we generally come out with 70, um, with this, this distribution over a period of time and of one and zero over a period of time. And so uh, what we now understand, of course, 
from just this diagram here is that in the quantum computing world, we're not looking at a deterministic type of computing device, but rather a probabilistic computing device. So it takes some getting used to in terms of how we uh, build out our quantum circuits, which are the programs that we have in quantum computing. And here, I'm representing a few of the qubits over here. We read them left to right like a sheet of music, the notes on a sheet of music. We apply our different operators here, and then we get a measurement and we get classical information out of the quantum computer. And of course, we can input that classical information, which is the output of the quantum computer, into a classical machine, into a CPU or GPU or TPU. And of course, we can iterate and make a whole loop of this where we have information coming out of the quantum computer. We can then process it in the classical regime, bringing it back into the quantum computer and going again and again. And so look for in the future, not quantum versus classical, but quantum hybridized with classical. That's the future of computing. And one of the advantages of quantum, of course, is the reputational space that you have with quantum. And you can see that very clearly here on this slide. And that has led to a number of algorithms that are not possible uh, to be implemented in any kind of um, tractable way in a classical computer we can now do in a quantum computer. Grover's giving us a quadratic advantage uh, in search over classical machines, not exponential, but quadratic. Shore is giving us exponential advantage over classical machines, of course, most famously for factoring large numbers, uh, which we'll see in a minute, and many other algorithms as well. And that leads to an application space uh, where we can look to a number of very important world-changing and transformative applications. An example would be drug discovery, where we can think about using AI initially to look at a combinatorial space of compounds uh, that we can then narrow down. So if you look at many, many different companies out there, Atomwise, Benevolent, Okin, and many others, these are companies that use AI to drive drug discovery and narrow down to a set of compounds. And then we can use quantum simulation of molecular interactions to understand how these specific compounds would interact with that receptor on a T cell, on a tumor, other kinds of ways of interacting uh, with the target in the body. So this combination of AI and quantum is very, very potent. We're just at the beginning uh, right now of this exploration of bringing AI and quantum together. And there's also been a lot of work in the unification of these various quantum algorithms, understanding the core building blocks that lead to things like Shores and Grover's and many of the other algorithms I was demonstrating earlier. So this kind of exponential speed up, we can see, for example, in Shor's algo, uh, developed by Peter Shor in 1994 in his paper when he was at Bell Labs. Today, he's at MIT. Uh, and this, of course, leads to the cyber attack that's happening right now. All of us at this conference are worried about cybersecurity. And uh, so when we think about cybersecurity, we often think about traditional cyber attacks. We also now must think about the attack happening right now of store now decrypt later, which is when people exfiltrate your RSA encrypted data or your elliptic curve encrypted data, store it for a number of years, and then decrypt it once they have additional computing power. But now let's really explore how we can bring AI and quantum together in different ways. Uh, and so if you look at this particular uh, graphic, we see the four quadrants. And for the past 60, 70 years of the history of computation, we have been relegated limited to the upper left quadrant. We have classical data, for example, in the ML world, in the deep learning world, we have ImageNet, we have all kinds of uh, pixels that we then convert numerically into information that we then bring into our neural networks. We might have other kinds of classical information, audio files, whatever the particular information is, and we run that on classical chips, GPUs, TPUs, CPUs, in order to run our neural networks uh, on these processors. But in fact, there are other quadrants out there. And over the next 5, 10, 20 years, we in, the, in computer science will be exploring different ways of combining both classical and quantum data as well as classical and quantum processors. So it's a very, very exciting time. One example of a, of a full stack in this particular case, um, I, I just pulled from TF Quantum, TensorFlow Quantum. There are others as well. But you can see on the bottom here on the hardware substrate, uh, we can have various classical 
uh, processing units, but also QPUs, quantum processing units. And then built on that hardware substrate, we can use a variety of frameworks and modeling, uh, and then also ultimately apply that both to classical data as well as quantum data. So this is where the future is going. It's a hybridization of classical and quantum. And you can imagine classification problems on the block sphere. These will need quantum processing. We cannot process and analyze these types of classifications using classical means. We have to go into a quantum regime in order to do so. And there are numerous papers coming out every single month uh, exploring this boundary of how do we use classical and quantum uh, in a machine learning or deep learning context uh, in order to gain advantage. Here's a recent paper uh, from a number of colleagues and I uh, commend this to the audience here at the conference, quantum advantage in learning from experiments. Uh, and just to show one graphic there, uh, they're looking at exploring the, the properties of exotic and new materials. Uh, and they are exploring that using this uh, hybridization approach, which is quite interesting. And I um, encourage people to check that out. In a short talk such as this today, we're not going to go into all the technical details, uh, but perhaps in a future talk, uh, we can spend the time uh, and go through it step by step, how one would build this and the code that we can use uh, to do so both on the classical machines and the quantum machines. One positive thing I can share with the audience here who might initially be wondering how we actually write our programs in the quantum world, we use Python. So the same Python that you know and love uh, in using uh, for classical deep learning, uh, we also use in the quantum regime as well. And here I have an example from another paper uh, where you can see that there's a quantum circuit uh, and that is being measured at the end giving you classical information as an output, which is then being fed into uh, a classical neural network that we'd all be familiar with. So these are different ways of, in, of having these both uh, deep learning networks uh, and also quantum neural networks interact in the same modeling uh, on different data sets. And so again, it's, it's both about the kind of processors we're using, but also we can begin to think about the hybridization in terms of data itself. Uh, all the data that probably everyone on this at this conference has been dealing with is classical data. But now that we're having the advent of, of quantum sensors and other quantum devices, we're going to be having data sets that are actually quantum in nature. And then we can preserve that quantum nature by feeding it right into a quantum processor and then combining the output from that with information that came from classical regime as well. So if you thought deep learning was already complex enough, um, wait till you have the hybridization of this all coming together. Uh, two um, uh, leading figures in this field that I want to highlight, uh, Maria Schuld um, and Amira Abbas, uh, which was her student actually uh, when she was doing her studies. Uh, and so I want to highlight and recommend to the audience to check out uh, both of these researchers and their work. Uh, they both have also wonderful videos, uh, which do a great job of giving you even more depth and seminars and courses uh, in QML, in quantum machine learning, in this emerging field. When we take a step back and look at the roadmap of quantum computing, it's quite an exciting one. Uh, today, we find ourselves in the NISC era, uh, and which is the noisy intermediate scale quantum era. And so these processes that we have have perhaps uh, dozens to hundreds, even low thousands of qubits uh, pretty soon. Um, so there's limiting uh, it's, it's really limited in terms of what we can do with these particular processors. But uh, the time is coming as we improve uh, across many, many different companies, IBM, IonQ, Google, I'm just highlighting three of them here today, but there's many other companies making progress such as PsyQuantum in the photonic area, QERA in the neutral atom area, many, many other companies that are making very significant progress around the world, as well as academic institutions itself. And of course, the holy grail will be this green area, uh, which will be the error-corrected, fault-tolerant, scaled quantum computer. And so while the hardware is improving, many other researchers are also working on error correction schemes. Uh, today, error correction schemes roughly have a ratio of about a thousand physical qubits needed to produce one logical or fault-tolerant uh, qubit. 
And so that's the rough ratio. So if you needed 4,200 or so logical qubits, for example, to run Troy's algorithm on a particular uh, commercial grade RSA key, uh, then you would need 1,000 times that or 4.2 million uh, physical qubits in order to run that. However, there may be advances over the next few years in error correction schemes. So look out for that as well. So this is really, really a very exciting time. And one thing I wanted to mention before summarizing is that in our own group, uh, we are training many, many master's PhD students and postdocs uh, in these new techniques and techniques that combine both traditional deep learning and all the techniques that we all know in the deep learning field with quantum techniques and really exploring the boundaries of what we can do in these different areas. And so if while you're getting your master's, while you're getting your PhD, if you want to spend some time with us, uh, you can do so. Uh, and of course, now during the pandemic, we do so virtually. You don't have to get on a plane. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we had folks join us uh, on site, but now we do so virtually. And these are three to six month uh, programs. We also host postdocs for uh, two year or three year postdoc positions across uh, and people can come from any of the major STEM fields to do so. So if you're interested, please reach out to Susie or Monica in, in doing so. Um, uh, people have highlighted the book. And so just want to mention that the second edition is out. But more importantly, the GitHub site has a lot of code that people can explore. QML, there's an example of QML on the site of quantum machine learning. So if you want to get your hands dirty and find out how to use Python coding that you know and love, from traditional deep learning and start to run it on actual quantum computers, you can download the code for free uh, from the GitHub site as well. So to summarize, this is a very exciting era uh, to take what we know, uh, all the advances that we have from deep learning, and now the more recent advances of quantum computing, and think about how we can start to bring these two fields together. Uh, we can bring it together either as really separate tools uh, in, in sequence, so we can apply AI, for example, to a drug discovery problem. And then once we have narrowed down our set of compounds, apply quantum techniques to further narrow down and refine that compound and structure to understand what would actually work in the body on that particular disease or condition. Uh, we can also think about a deeper hybridization of machine learning and quantum, actually thinking about uh, running both deep learning, traditional models on classical chips, and then feeding them into quantum uh, deep learning as well, where we represent the neural net and the data in ways that have just been developed over the last five, six years uh, in a quantum computer. And then, of course, we can have a loop that brings these two together in hybridized format. And of course, the, the nature of quantum computing being cloud native, being born on the cloud, right alongside its cousins of CPU, GPU, TPU, and other classical processing units means that it's really easy going forward to bring these together. So uh, thank you very much for having me here today. It's very, very exciting, the future as we bring the very power of AI and the power of quantum together. And it's gonna be a wonderful journey exploration over the coming years. Thank you very much.